All right, guys, what is up? Swim here, and we're back with the improved, I guess I would say. I can't say that it's technically better, but it is built a little bit different, and I do like this version, Fiora deck. Now, this is a deck that I would call my Fiora Exodia deck. This is very, very specifically an all-in deck. We are all in on the Fiora game plan. We have almost nothing else left on the table. If Fiora falls through, we probably won't be winning this game, right? So we're gonna take this time to break down this deck. I think this is one of the more fun decks. I'm very, very tempted to craft this on day one. I think it's a pretty powerful deck. I think it's, I, I would call it probably a tier two deck, maybe a little higher, I'm not sure. It's very difficult to say. But this is a pretty powerful deck and it's something that is quite a lot of fun and of course we'll play for the unique condition of Fiora's whole uh, auto win button. So the pros and the cons, who is this deck for? Well, this is a very fun deck that plays very differently. I would say this deck is the most different way to play the game while still having a powerful win condition. There's a lot of decks that might play for like different win conditions, you know, like an all in Teemo deck or like other crazy combo decks, but outside of some big elusive OTK combo, which also can be fairly competitive, this is the one other deck in the game that I think can remain competitive while having a, I would say, entirely separate win condition. So that makes this deck a little bit tricky to play in some ways, uh, but not necessarily difficult to master in terms of, you know, once you understand that you need to take different opportunities than a normal deck, the deck actually isn't that hard to play out. I would say the biggest pro is that it's a lot of fun, you'll be able to win games, and on top of that, it might even be somewhat of a meta counter to a lot of like more tempo-y style decks should have a bit of a disadvantage against the one, uh, and on the downside, you will run into problems when you're against like more controly style decks, if they're running cards like Vengeance or Detain without running Deny, we don't really have an answer to that, but unfortunately Ionia doesn't support the Fiora game plan enough to justify running alongside. Now, if this sounds like the kind of deck for you, make sure to check in the pinned comments because I'm going to be leaving a link to the Mobilytics version. The important reason for this is because I can update that version and I can't update this video retroactively. So if I end up tuking one or two cards, you will see them updated on that link, but not here. All right, so let's get into the actual builds. Now we're gonna talk about deck building stuff for quite some time, so if you just wanna see gameplay, you can also check out in the comments. I'm sure someone will have linked to the timestamp for when the gameplay actually begins. And lastly, this deck was not just made by me, but also my boy Precipic. We put our heads together to be able to kind of like ratio this out and choose all the tools in question. A lot of deck building in card games is not necessarily a solo endeavor, and you know, it's important to give credit where credit is due. So here's the Precipic. Okay, so we're going to go through each card in this deck, and after that I'm going to talk about some cards that aren't in this deck uh, that you might have expected should be in this deck and why they aren't in this deck. Alright, so just to start with the most valuable core pieces, we've got Fiora. Fiora is pretty straightforward, this is just a powerhouse card, and the reason for her being is really simple. She's your win condition. When you've killed two enemies, she just levels up and gets stats, and then when you've killed two more enemies after that, four total, she will basically trigger effect that wins you the game, period. Uh, no questions asked, right? This is pretty powerful, and the deck is built around the ability to get her kills without dying, so ways to protect her, like Chain Vest, Brittle Steel, Elixir of Iron, and even Radiant Strike, uh, along with Prismatic Barrier uh, and Judgment is a fantastic way to close out a game, because when she strikes multiple units, they, if she kills them, count as kills. So if you have a Fiora and you Judgment and you kill four units, the game has ended. You have won, right? In addition to that, uh, other support cards are Take Heart, which can buff her if she's damaged, and standalone, which, you know, can buffer if she's the only unit on your board. This is actually really, really easy to, you know, make happen with standalone. If you play something like Avros and Sentry on turn two, you can just block something with it, you know, let it die, and then you'll still be able to st stand alone your Fiora right after that, no problem. Lastly, we've got Single Combat, which is another Fiora support card. Uh, there's a few ways to make this work, an ally and an enemy strike each other, uh, but effectively, sometimes you can cheese out quick games. Your opponent, you know, on like turn five might like tap out, and if you have single combat, 
two single combats in hand, sometimes you can just kind of like cheese the game out early, even if they might have had an answer to it. Uh, it also works very well with Braum and Vanguard Redeemer. More on that in a little bit. Okay, so now that we've covered the fewer part of this deck and why that's so uh, powerful and why there's so much you can do with that, let's talk about Braum's inclusion in the list because Braum is really, really, really important in this list. And I think uh, talking about this list, it's important to understand why we're running Braum and maybe to a larger degree, Freljord in general. So Braum is in this list uh, for a couple of reasons, but the biggest one is as a contingency for if you haven't drawn Fiora in your opening hand yet. Usually your odds of drawing her are actually pretty great uh, because of Avarism. We'll talk about the exact math later. I will break down the odds of drawing Fiora by turn X, but Avarism Sentry obviously is a draw tool, and Vanguard Redeemer is a very, very powerful draw tool. Again, more on that later. So Braum, most importantly, can buy you a few turns to be able to draw your Fiora and will be a really, 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 really phenomenal buff target for situations like that. Can slow down the game immensely. Braum is a card that honestly is pretty underwhelming in general, but when he picks up the buffs, uh, he's able to effectively go off, right? Because even though he's a 0-5, with just one big buff, and a big buff is going to be either Take Heart or Standalone, uh, I just moused over the wrong ones, T uh, Take Heart or Standalone, uh, he will be a 3-8 with Challenger and Regen, which is really, really, really powerful. You'll be able to kill, you know, a unit every turn, even on your offense, and slow the board down greatly. He will be almost impossible to remove, like, even when your opponent is at, like, Vengeance mana, like, maybe they can kill him at that point, um, but they're not going to get a crazy amount of value from that, so should ultimately work out fine. I should point out, he also happens to work really well with single combat, because, you know, if you have that amount of health uh, and regen, you don't really sacrifice health when you go to kill something. So, it's a good stabilizer tool, and if you're going to do something like Avalanche, well, Braum doesn't really mind taking the damage. In fact, he might enjoy it. He's into that kind of thing. All right, so... Let's go ahead and break down the kind of final component of the draw power in this list, which is Vanguard Redeemer. Now, you might look at this interface and you might say, well, Swim, 28 spells. What's up with that? Actually, you might say, Swim, your big fat head is blocking the amount of spells in this list. And then I might say, it's 28 spells. And then you might say, well, Swim, there's 28 spells. What's up with that? Well, I'll tell you. So, 28 spells, we have so many spells, particularly in part because Vanguard Redeemer is able to draw a unit. Now, this is a really, really important part of this card's description that I think a lot of people overlook. When I'm summoned to draw a unit if an ally died this round. Super powerful, because what that means is it gives me great odds of drawing Fiora, or at the very least, possibly Braum. Uh, so we're going to need to be triggering that with stuff like Averroes and Sentry, as well as, you know, the Braum and Fiora that we have. And one card that I haven't talked about yet, which is Succession. This card looks strange. I know it looks strange. This is a weak card. I wouldn't even run this in a spell deck. This is the one deck in the game that I would run it in, but I'm we're, we're not talking about it yet. We'll, we'll get to it. Okay. So Vanguard Redeemer. Super powerful card. Uh, it's a great way of letting you just have high tier draw options for Fiora and Braum and really increasing the math that well, you will have your Fiora by turn five is, I would say, the most important. Like, if you draw Fiora after turn five, she might not be super impactful, but the, the biggest thing about this deck is we need to increase our odds as much as possible of drawing her by turn five. Okay, so that's Vanguard Redeemer, and the most important thing when you're playing with this card is to understand, you know, when to kind of float mana and let a unit die to be able to play it. You want to time your unit's deaths around this card, and that can be pretty important. But in a deck like this, it absolutely does fit in, probably as a three of. So this obviously deals two to all units, which means if you don't have a lot of unit presence on the board, you're okay taking damp damage. You might notice that basically every unit in this deck, A, doesn't mind dying in the case of Avaros and Sentry, or B, won't die to Avalanche in the case of Succession's Dauntless Vanguard being a three health, Braum and Fiora exceeding its health, and even like Vanguard Redeemer sometimes, you know, you, you will have an Avalanche board state where your Redeemer will survive at one. There's a lot going on there. But mostly you're using Avalanche when you have an empty board and you're just trying to slow down the game 
game when your opponent is developing these aggro tempo tools, okay? So Avalanche, like I said, truly needs no introduction. Against Ionia, be careful of them potentially denying this, and Ionia is an aggro region that will often be running deny. So if you can trap your opponent out by, you know, making sure you're avalanching a little bit of a safer situation where, you know, maybe they don't have mana for deny, that can be pretty valuable. And lastly, Succession. All right, so why is Succession in this deck? Because this card is bad. I, 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 will, I will say this card is bad. This Truly, this is the only deck this card should be in. Okay, it's a three mana, three, three. And as you might have guessed already, part of the reason in this deck is because of Vanguard Redeemer. Vanguard Redeemer is a very interesting tool that can tutor specific tools into your hand. But most importantly, with Vanguard Redeemer, you'll notice in its ability that it draws you a unit and that incentivizes you to have fewer units in your deck because you want to be able to tutor specifically what you want, but it also only triggers if a unit died this round on your side, which incentivizes you to have more units in your deck. It's a paradox, sort of, right? So enter Succession. Succession has the ability to be a unit in the you know form of being able to trigger Redeemer's ability, and you can have a unit die for it, but it's also not a unit in your deck, so it doesn't clunk up your Redeemer's chances of drawing you what you need, right? Lastly, and this is very, very important for this deck, this deck will never play a card on turn one. On turn one of the game, this deck will never, ever play a card. You literally can't. On turn two of the game, you'll often be playing Avros and Sentry, but this is the only card you can play on turn two, and you only have three of them in your deck. Uh, so you will be hard mulliganing for these though, so you've got good odds. But enter succession. This is really important. This is a turn two play for this deck. Basically, it's the play that will help you out, you know, because you're always floating one mana going into spell reserve. And if you don't draw Avaros and Sentry, it's really important to have a turn two play, A, just to not die and, you know, stuff, but B, to enable the um, Vanguard Redeemers that you're going to need, because you do need some unit to die. So Succession ends up being a pretty nice turn two play for this deck. Again, if this was, it, it, the stars are aligning, truly. Truly, the, the stars are aligning for, for Succession to make sense in this deck. All right. Um, so that wraps up. Okay. All right, so now that we understand each card's function in the list, let's go ahead and talk about a couple of cards that didn't make the cut and why they didn't make the cut. So the most obvious one, I think, is Entreat. A lot of people will look at Entreat as a card and think, man, why, if your deck is built around such a uh, committed win condition, are you not running Entreat? It's not because it you know, got changed or anything, by the way, you know, I'll pull out up here. Um, but Entreat is a card that can draw a champion. So for the record, I think this is a bad card. If you look at my card ratings sheet, uh, which you can find in the description of this video, that should be in every video, it should be a link to the like LOR info hub that I made. And I rate Entreat as an F card which is surprising because it's a very unique card and should more likely fit into the P category. The reason for that is because it costs two mana, which is really, really, really quite a lot, right? To the point where it it, it also has a pretty heavy deck building cost and that's gonna increase as time goes on. But basically, if I was running entries, I probably wouldn't be able to run Brahms or I wouldn't be able to run as many Brahms. And the fact that this cost me two mana is really, really bad for having like no body. Like when you compare it to Vanguard Redeemer, it ends up being like basically the same thing because Vanguard Redeemer will almost always draw you one of these champions. Um, but this has a 3-3 unit attached to it, which is a really, really, really big deal. So entry is somewhat of a consideration for this deck, but I definitely don't like it. I'm leaning very much away from it. Maybe there's some reality where I could fit it in as a one of possibly. Most units in general, I'm just not going to be able to run because, you know, if I run units, then it's kind of like it hurts my odds on Redeemer. And also it kind of makes some cards like standalone maybe a little bit worse as well, because while it's not usually a big deal to sacrifice an early unit, they can potentially get, you know, there, there, there can be those weird situations where once every while that can be awkward. But mostly I have a very narrow game plan and all of these supports, uh, all of these spells are supporting this game plan anyway, right? So I end up not really needing uh, a lot of units in that way, right? So a couple of good options that could be good in the deck. Detain is a fairly powerful card. I have nothing wrong with this card. I actually might I might be able to fit it into this deck as like a, a one of or, or, or possibly a two of. It's, it's a bit of a meta call. I think that would be fine since I'm usually like all in on my cards living anyway. You know, if games are going a bit longer, Detain could totally be fine. It actually has no problem fitting into a deck like this. 
A card like Relentless Pursuit is actually uh, somewhat fun. I don't think I want the additional attacks so much. It ends up being kind of like a worse version of single combat, effectively. Like, an extra attack can be nice if I have Fiora, but usually won't be enough to make a difference. And then we've got the Frostbite cards, which are... Flash Freeze, I think is the is the name of the card with the, the hand. Flash Freeze, Freeze... Uh, yeah, Flash Freeze, Frostbite on Enemy, as well as... Uh, harsh winds. Uh, oh, f okay, wait. I can just censor it out. We're good. Okay, harsh winds. <laughs> we're good. We're good. Harsh winds. Uh, and with harsh winds, you know, obviously it could be kind of okay in this deck, but uh, I end up not really needing it that much. There's just better options. Like the frostbite tools are kind of neat. But they don't do a ton, except for, of course, Brutal Steel, which is really, really powerful. Brutal Steel is going to be uh, doing, obviously, a lot here. This is just the best Frostbite card by far. Okay, and lastly, let's talk about some important kind of like checks for a balance of decks. You really want to make sure your deck is, you know, there's a lot of metrics, there's a lot of rules of thumb that might indicate that your deck is ratioed properly or, you know, cursed. <laughs> This, this is not the kind of deck that worries about curve, don't worry, or curved properly, uh, you know, balance between proactive and reactive plays. Let's go ahead and break out how that's going to work. So one really important rule of thumb is, and I've mentioned this several times, I like talking about this, I think it's a really important point of deck building, which is that good decks typically will have uh, 10 or 11 core cards, core being three of, so let's go ahead and count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10. So as a kind of more situationally combo deck with high draw power, having 10 core cards is totally fine. You'll find a lot of good decks end up with 11, and you'll also see we have no one-ofs, which makes me happy, because one-ofs are usually kind of a sign of almost weakness, I guess I would say, in a deck. Not always, obviously there are exceptions, but as a rule of thumb, a one-of is usually a sign of just hesitation on the deck builder's part. Um... Often that, that's what you'll see in decks if they're just like not sure what to cut or what to consolidate. Usually twos and threes are more often going to be what you're going for. And one of should be limited to like probably two tops per deck. Almost always at most. So one last important check is, you know, making sure we have enough spells for our spell mana. Yeah, I think we've got that covered here. We're good. Um, and then finally, proactive versus reactive plays. It's a little tricky with this deck because it's very combo-y and very situational. We do have a lot of reactive plays jammed in, and we can draw hands that are a little clunky and don't allow for proactivity, but we've put in about the maximum proactivity that we could. If I end up playing the game a bit and decide it's actually a little lacking, I would be very happy to add in a Stalking Wolf or possibly two. It does hurt Redeemer odds a bit, but it's a proactive early play that I think might be able to, you know, be a bit more value than Succession in some cases. But I do want to talk about Succession one last thing before we get into the game, because I think the mentality behind adding this to the deck is really, really important. So as a deck builder, I think the, like, there's so many mentalities you need, but one of the most important is a mentality of problem solving. Don't add things to the deck because you want them in the deck, but think about how the game is going to play out and think about what your biggest problems with the deck are, whether they be matchups, whether they be hand states, whatever, and then design cards that solve those problems, right? Don't help situations where your deck is already fine, right? It's not just about matchups, it's also about draw states, and you'll see that in succession. So the biggest problem with this deck, well, there's a couple. One is Vengeance slash Detain. I think there's actually very little this deck can do about that. In reality, I mean, if you have like a second Fiora or, you know, if your buffs are able to snowball and overwhelm the board, you can actually win against Vengeance and Detain, and that's fine. It will hurt your win rate, and notably so, but it's not an unwinnable spot. The most important thing you can do against Vengeance and Detain is not stack too many buffs on one units in matchups against Shadow Isles or Freljord, right? And from a deck building perspective, there's nothing we can really do here to solve that issue. Another issue we have as a deck build, and this is probably the number one issue, is that our own draws might kind of screw us, right? And that's pretty simple to understand. It's a combo deck. If we draw, like if our opening hand is bad cards, we have to mulligan all of them, and we draw something like 
uh, I don't know, Nightmare Scenario, like three Elixirs of Iron and a Judgment or something like that. If that's our opening hand, that's really bad. Our win rate is bad for that game. You know, that will happen sometimes. It's a combo deck. And the most important thing is basically to have methods of being able to help our bad hands and increase our odds of turning a bad hand into a good hand. And that is the third and final and most important reason why Succession is in this deck. Do you guys remember my Dawn Spiders video where I put in War Chefs over Lucian? That is also coming from the problem-solving mentality. Lucian is a decent card, but it doesn't solve problems. It plays into problems. It makes the problem of Avalanche worse, and it makes the idea... It, it turns a card like Mystic Shot that wasn't a problem into a sort of potential problem, right? Whereas War Chefs in that deck is a problem solver because that's a deck that... I, I don't think Avalanche is a huge problem, but it's one, it's one of the only problems that deck has. It's an extremely powerful deck, maybe the strongest deck in the game. And War Chefs solves that problem super well, okay? Problem solving mentality, super, super, super important. So Succession... In that situation where our hand is bad, you know, maybe we draw succession on two in Vanguard Redeemer, and we're in a situation where, you know, our Vanguard Redeemer has higher odds of being able to pull something that's not a unit. We have a unit that can get buffed, and our successions aren't bricking the Redeemer. You know, there's a lot this does to help our draws, right? Because the ability to have a unit that's a 3-3 three, three on turn two without, you know, hurting Redeemer's odds will increment our percentage of drawing the right thing. All right, and one final thing I'm gonna do here before we jump into the games, I know we've been talking your ear off for ages, but one last thing I'm gonna be doing here is we are going to go ahead and, uh, ooh, that's not right. We're gonna go ahead and switch over to our good old hypergeometric calculator to show you guys how the math is going to break down on these draws. So let's just go ahead and pull this up here. This is this happens to be Etherhub. This is a site for magic, but you can use hypergeometric calculators. I mean, you just Google it, you'll find it. It's it's straightforward. Um, but basically, it's a method of trying to you know calculate how many average hits we're gonna have to be able to find a card on our terms. Okay, so the average amount of turns it'll take to find a card. It's just an estimation tool for that. It's really hard to get this math like super 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 precise, like down to the decimal percentage. But that's fine. We don't need to be that precise. So we're going to start with a sample size of nine. I think this is the general default. You, you know, start with four cards, you mulligan two. So that's a total of six. And then when you draw three over the next three turns, you're going to be at a sample size of nine if you're mulliganing two. So that's an average deck by turn three is going to start with a sample size of nine, which is how many cards you've seen by, you know, the point of the game you want to see if you'll have those odds or not. Okay. But because this deck mulligans very deep, you will mulligan every card that's not named Fiora or Avros and Sentry if you don't have a Fiora. Those are the only two cards you'll keep, I think. Maybe possibly Brown in some matchups. Um, but let's go ahead and make the sample size 11 instead uh, by turn three. Because A, you know, we're mulliganing deeper, so that's maybe one more card. And B, we'll probably have drawn a card off of Avros and Sentry. So it's going to be 11 by turn three. And again, we don't need Fiora by turn three in every situation. Let's go ahead and make it 13 because we're looking at the turn four draw and the turn five draw. So we're sampling 13 cards so far. And then lastly, Redeemer. We're going to have to add those odds in a bit separately because Redeemer's math is a little bit more complicated. So if your odds, easiest thing to do is just three successes in population. That's totally fine. And let's go ahead and calculate this. It's going to be around 70%. And look at that, 70.4%. All right. So the chance to draw uh, one or more Fioras by turn five is 70.4%, which is not as high as it could be if I was running an entreat version of the deck. It would be higher, but the problem with that is uh, losing the ability to run Braum is a really, really big hurt to the deck, and paying two extra mana for a Fiora can allow a lot of like aggro decks to kind of get under you in a very unfortunate way. So right now, Fiora naturally by turn five is 70%. Now, the trick is we have to add in Vanguard Redeemer, and that's going to be a little tricky to do. I will have to do some estimations. I, I don't want to spend like 30 minutes doing like the super, super, super precise math. Um, but basically just to show like, 
you know, you will have good odds. So Vanguard Redeemer, by the way, it has the same exact odds uh, because it's still three copies in the deck and you're looking to see if those, if for to try to get one, right, by this turn. So Vanguard Redeemer, you know, at this point in time, if you haven't drawn Fiora yet, which is the assumption, will have very good odds of drawing the Fiora. Uh, the odds are you might have drawn Brown, you've probably drawn like one Redeemer, you know, one uh, Avarice and Sentry or something like that. So often you'll be in a situation between, you know, at the 12 units that you have left into the deck three of them are going to be fioras at least one of them is drawn because at least one of them is the redeemer you're playing so that's obviously going to be a pool of 11 instead of uh sorry 12 and if you have you know either a brown or an avaroism century let's go ahead and call it 9.5 right so you're looking for the three out of a 9.5 on one redeemer you're playing and you've got something like 33 percent odds right so that's going to shore up this 70 percent up to something closer to 80 percent low 80s realistically speaking it'll be between like 80 and 84 percent probably of having a fiora on turn five which is pretty good keep in mind this deck can against a lot of decks this deck still will have the ability don't get me wrong it won't be amazing this deck will still have the ability to win when you don't draw the fiora by that turn uh you know you will sometimes have a brown that's just large and in charge and it will just pop off and some opponents just can't answer that right especially when he levels up that's still fine drawing the fiora later against some slow decks that might not have an answer to her is also still fine right so that's just kind of like the math on the Fiora breakdown. We could achieve uh, rates of closer to 95% if we were running a version with Entreat instead of Brown, but I've decided that 80% is fine. That last 15%, I'm more than happy to have Brown along for the ride, and there's a lot of situations where I have drawn Fiora in those cases, and I would much rather have a Brown than an Entreat. One thing we actually forgot to mention about Brown because I'm not very, I'm not, I'm not, I don't plan out these videos very well. I was going to mention this, I just forgot. Oh, by the way, he happens to have probably the best ever champion spell in the entire game. The reason for that is not because Take Heart is necessarily a good spell, but because champion spells are always going to be on in your hand when you have that champion on board. So you want a spell that's going to be able to pop off when you have the champion on board. And when you have a Brown on board, Take Heart is literally the perfect spell in the entire game out of all the spells. So Brown gets bonus points due to that, and it's just so hard to fit an entry. All right, that's it. We're done with all the deck building talk. Let's get into the actual games. This is what I know you guys are waiting for. You've probably skipped ahead to this point already, actually. <laughs> All right, let's get into a game here. Uh, we've got our opening hand in front of us, and we're against the good old Elise bot, as we always are. So, uh, to break this off, we've got Fiora in our opening hand, and because we already have Fiora, it can be okay to keep a Chain Vest. This is also a pretty good matchup for Braum, and Succession is not as good when we have a hand that's already developed, and we are going to need it a lot less. Let's go ahead and just play for the Fiora Chain Vest. I think this is a fine condition. Between these two, we shouldn't end up needing Braum, and whoa, look at that. We actually have a pretty good hand here. I don't cherry pick these videos, by the way. I literally just like record the first one that plays, which is why a lot of these, a lot of these guides have like fairly awkward hands, and some of them, this, this spider deck actually gets me to like 10 health or something. Um, but hey, look at this. This is a good hand. Okay, so aggro spiders, as always. This deck is skipping turn one, and because we don't have the uh, avarice century or succession i remember the card name succession uh the bad nor normally bad card that summons the vanguard we can't play on these turns but we do have the fiora here and this fiora is about to pop off so pretty straightforward we're gonna go ahead and get a reduction here but he's tapped out he has no mana left up and that makes us uh, in a pretty prime position to just go ahead and get our proactive chain vest and start feeding off of these little spiders right so we want to get a kill. Uh, the Chain Vest is going to do a pretty amazing amount in this matchup. Let's go ahead and get a kill on this two attack spider. Um, we could hit the Aristocrat instead, but I'd really get a, I'd really rather get a spider off his board. I don't mind losing health here. And we're just going to go ahead and get his uh, Nexus with this Fiora effect. Is that a new animation, by the way? I don't actually know if Fiora was doing that before. I think there was the big one at the end, but I don't, I don't know about this. Okay. So, you'll notice that even if he plays a kill spell here, like Black Spear, we have got Standalone to keep Fiora out of kill ranges. Um, and we've got a total of 6 mana for Take Heart and Standalone as well. So there's a couple things we can do here. Um, I think one important thing is, you know, let's just not make sure, let's make sure we're not taking too much damage for no reason. Let's go ahead and Standalone the Fiora. Um, now, I know that this bot deck doesn't happen to have 
any weird thing, like for example, um, I know it doesn't happen to have Vengeance, so I'm gonna treat this like it's a normal aggro deck and develop units and buff the Fiora, okay? Now, what I could do, and I wanna stress this, this is very important, what I could have done there, instead of playing the Vanguard, is I could have waited one turn, okay? I could have waited one turn, I had three mana, put this three mana in the reserve, next turn we get five mana, right? Plus three means we Judgment. And we would have won the game here on turn five. Okay, do you see that? That's really, really important to understand. We would have, or I guess not turn five, because he doesn't have token on turn five. But we would have, we would have basically just wiped his board. The reason I didn't do that is because I want to make this very clear. Like, I, I want to play these like they're real games. And against the real human being opponent, I wouldn't do something greedy like that. I would make sure to develop the Redeemer to make sure we have the ability to not get run over too fast, right? But... We do have the ability to win extremely early with this combo, and with Judgment, you do have to keep in mind, banking mana is pretty important. So we're at the turn 5, we still have the Fiora that's able to just gain that infinite value, and one important thing you'll notice as well is we used standalone before we developed more units, right? Um, which is very important. I'm going to go ahead and take a double attack here, and we'll go ahead and chain Redeemers after this. So Fiora can just go ahead and punch through something pretty big. I think the Skitterer will deal two damage to her through the Chain Vest. She'll go down to three, and at three health, she'll still be out of range of everything because uh, Grasp of the Dying Three will do all damage, and the Chain Vest will make that two, so she'll be totally fine. We'll take this attack. This Redeemer is gonna get blocked out, and then I'll chain the Redeemer off of it. If it draws me the Averrosen Sentry, which is about a 40% chance, if it draw, uh, no, 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 sorry, it's less than that. It's, it's, it's closer to like 30%. If it draws me the Sentry, then we can curve out and use that additional mana there, which is pretty nice. Um, but if not, we can also just win with Fiora with Judgment. I mean, it's really up to us how we want to do that. If we want to take the flashy play or not. I mean, I like the flashy play. Crawling Sensation, uh, yeah, that's fine. That's no problem. Uh, the one, the one thing about Judgment is, in his deck, he might have, uh, basically two kill spells. So she's at four right now. He would have to have double grasp, he doesn't have the mana for that because of the Chain Vest. Chain Vest actually does a pretty ridiculous amount. Let's go ahead and play Redeemer here. It's a good way to curve this. Because we did the math, we realized we don't need to give Fiora more health. Um, she's perfectly fine already. We draw the second Fiora, and this is going to give us Fiora's Riposte. This is, contrary to Brahms, this is a pretty bad card. You will use it sometimes, and it's not useless, but it's not necessarily great. So, he does a big attack with everything. We have the Judgment Spot. Unfortunately, it's a little vulnerable to Vengeance here. Um, and I don't think I want to take that Vengeance vulnerability, right? So, I think that's that's pretty important to note. There's a few alternate lines we can pursue, basically. Uh, I mean, we want to block this with Fiora. If he, if he is running a card like Vengeance, you know, we have the ability to use it on the Vanguard Redeemer instead. Um, the Fiora is obviously the flashier play, but if we fork his Vengeance, he can't really get enough value to kill us down in this 3 health. So I think that's th this, is, this is basically the correct thing to do, right? Again, as flashy as it is to use Judgment on Fiora, it makes us very vulnerable to a counterplay, and I know this bot deck doesn't have Vengeance in it, but I want to show you guys as if this was a human. And this is what you would do if this guy was a human. You would block with Fiora, and then you would use Judgment on a Redeemer. The most important thing is, that means if he uses Vengeance to stop the Judgment, he doesn't have Vengeance for Fiora. If he uses Vengeance to stop the Fiora, he doesn't have the Vengeance to stop the Judgment. So we're winning slower this way, but we're making sure we're playing around that lose condition. And I don't want to instill upon you guys bad habits, right? Let's let's not go for flashy plays and let's play to win the game like normal human beings. Okay. And we can develop the board a little bit here. I'd like to get Sentry to die so he can draw a card. So I'm fine just playing him out a little bit more aggressively. Uh, we play into Guile, I guess. Ugh. I mean, I think normal decks wouldn't be running Guile in the spot, but I mean, I guess that slows me down a little bit. Not really anything. I mean, I don't, I don't really mind at this point, but I guess it's true. There's nothing I can really do about that. Um, sure. So I'll just play this out. I don't think there's really anything else I can do this round, but as you can see, this game is pretty cleared out. He's got two cards in hand. We've got six, and we've got the Avalanche in hand, even if he is able to do something like kind of wacky. Go ahead and burn this mana. I'm fine with that. Two mana out. 
Okay, so again, he takes an attack. We take the Fiora. Let's go ahead and protect our Fiora. Um, yeah, this is fine. I don't think there's anything fancy to do in this spot at all. And we have the basically 20 Nexus health win next turn. You can see this chain vest just popping off. Look at all this chain vest value that it's been getting. It's pretty crazy. Um, if we had single strike, the game would be over right now because we would just single strike the spider. But honestly, it doesn't really end up mattering that much. Um, a loose condition is still that vengeance in theory. Uh, so, I mean, committing additional buffs doesn't really... It's not something we want to do while, uh, you know... While he hasn't done anything yet, because there's, there's there's a way this game could play out where you know we top deck something, um, and I'll just keep this passing. I mean, I don't really need mana at this point. There's nothing I'm gonna need it for. Go into the spider, and that's gonna be it. So Fiora's gonna get her fourth kill, and we're basically just going to take the game home right here. So again, in a lot of situations, the most important thing to understand about how this plays out is it might have looked weird there how we ended up basically finishing that game right it looked it looked kind of like we had the fiora and you know she didn't end up doing all that much and the reason for that is because we chose not to take any unnecessary risks in that case right we played around a specific lose condition and when you're against an aggressive deck usually denying their win condition is going to do pretty much the same amount as helping your own right uh, probably more, if anything. So, play more around the aggro decks, win condition, try to slow them down as much as possible, don't take risks when you're in a pretty dominant position, which we were the entire game, from the opening hand, despite the fact that we had a lower amount of health, there was nothing he could have done to punch through at any point in the game. And, as long as we just play safe, we're gonna be able to get our win condition off. And that is the builder on Fiora, like, Exodia deck. This is a deck that I, unironically, I'm thinking about crafting it on day one and taking it to ranked ladder. I do think it's probably not the single highest win rate deck in the game, uh, for sure, but it is very powerful. It, it, like, it is a deck that is competitive, and it's going to be a lot of fun, I think, in a lot of, like, like very unique situations where you're going to have to think in very, very unique ways. All right, boys, that's going to be it for here. Let me know if you have any feedback. Uh, you guys might have noticed I'm doing these YouTube videos a bit different and even a bit different every time because I'm trying out like slightly different things, slightly different format tweaks. So let me know if you have any ideas. I'm not just saying that. I'll actually like, I'll, I'll actually read the ideas and I'll probably implement some of them if they're, you know, if they're good because I do want to try to make these YouTube videos a bit more polished. All right, that's it for me and I'll see you guys next time.